Good morning, lovelies. Today we're going to talk about how to write a romantic subplot in your science fiction or fantasy story. Now, I have hesitated on making this video for a very long time for a variety of reasons, the biggest one being that I am a romantic asexual. I do not experience romantic or sexual attraction at all. I did once have a crush on a theater geek named Dan in high school. Now, was that genuine romantic attraction that I'm actually gray? Was it aesthetic attraction that I just mistook for something sexual? Was it teenage hormones being weird? Who knows? I sure don't. Normally, I can fake that type of attraction in my writing, the way I fake many things I've never experienced before. Murder, space exploration, enjoying Hawaiian pizza. Google is the greatest writing tool you are ever going to have. But when it comes to making a video teaching others how to do this, I, you know what, I decided that I should probably call in some backup and bring a professional in to at least help me write the script for this video. My mom. Nah, you, you laugh, but I did choose her for a couple of very valid reasons. Number one, like most people on this planet, she is aloe, I think. I mean, she's been with the same guy for 30 plus years, she's managed to successfully do the sex thing at least twice, and she is truly shameless in her celebrity crushes. But on a more serious note, she is also an international paranormal romance bestseller who has hit the New York Times and USA Today list many, 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 many times. Now originally I wanted to do an interview where she and I would sit down and I'd grill her with all the questions, effectively removing myself as a middleman. But that didn't work with our schedules, and I honestly wasn't sure if that was something you guys would be interested in. If you do want to see such an interview, tell us in the comments, I'll make it happen. In the meantime, I asked her some questions that I hope this video will answer and then use them to build the script. And I had the brilliant idea to make her do this while she was handling both her taxes and the release of two new books. Which is why this video is coming out in April rather than on Valentine's Day like I had originally planned. Thanks for fucking up my YouTube schedule, mom. No, but seriously, thanks for helping me out with this. So with that needlessly long introduction out of the way, Let's get started. Remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos on science fiction, fantasy, and horror through a feminist lens. And if you want some bonus content and to directly support this channel, I've got a Patreon page. It's linked in the description. So first things first, you need to determine whether or not your story actually needs a romantic subplot. Yes, romance is very common and something that most people end up experiencing and wanting at some point or many points in their lives. But we are not constantly looking for it every minute of every day. I assume so, you aloes have to get some other stuff done at some point, right? Depending on the story, romance just might not be a priority at the moment. It could even distract from the main plot. I don't need to give any examples here, all right? We all have our own personal frustrations where we had to endure a romantic subplot that had no business being there at all. So the first thing you have to do when writing one is seriously consider does this kind of relationship belong in my story? Would it make more sense to do a more of a parental child relationship? or a sibling relationship, or maybe these characters just stay friends. Romantic subplots are so common in our media that a lot of authors subconsciously or consciously think that they have to include one, but you don't. Unless you are explicitly writing a romance story, this element is completely optional. Let me repeat this for the ones in the back. Romantic subplots are optional. In fact, if you don't include one, you are automatically going to spark a lot of interest and attention from several people in the aromantic asexual community who are sick of seeing them everywhere, and even some outside of the community. Ah, but what if your story includes a dramatic rescue and you want to raise the stakes? It's not just that the bad guy has captured the princess, this is also the woman that the hero has a crush on. Romance rescues can be great, but again, not necessary. The hero might just be a patriot who wants his royal sovereign back. 
or he's a mercenary hired to rescue or perhaps initially kidnap the princess and over the course of the story and his interactions with her comes to value more than that. Or maybe the princess is a heartless bitch who manipulates him to helping her out and then betrays him. You could subvert the romance rescue by having the man be the damsel and the woman has to save him. That is uncommon enough that adding it to your story will make it stand out. Just a heads up though, you will get a lot of bro flicks on your back for daring to suggest that a physically fit man might need to be rescued, especially by a woman. So just brace yourself for endlessly eye rolling at them and then move on. Ah, but what if you're writing a revenge story and you need to kick it off by murdering the hero's wife? This is called the women in the refrigerator trope, and it is sexist garbage. Find a better use for your femme characters than killing them off to motivate men, because we are sick of it. It might be worth it if you fridge the man, like what happened in Salt, but that's still killing a character who might otherwise be more interesting alive. Also, make sure that your characters actually have chemistry. Don't force something that doesn't want to happen. You can have the best actors in the world portraying your love scenes, but if the characters in question don't click, it's going to be super awful and dreadful. I asked my mom specifically how to create romantic character chemistry, and this is what she had to say on it. I basically let the characters talk to me. For example, in my last romance, A Wolf After My Own Heart, I knew my hero Oz, a werewolf, had a rich social life, but a piss poor dating life. His twin died when they were kids, and he's always felt that lost, and he never clicked with the right woman. I knew he was lonely and drawn to the odd, so he was drawn immediately to my heroine, who is most definitely odd. She's not a shifter, but can take care of herself, drives a decommissioned ambulance, routinely walks around armed to the teeth, has major control over her emotions, and wasn't remotely scared of him, all of which he found enchanting. Basically, you figure out what your character is missing, even if they don't consciously realize it, and create a character who has what they need. Okay, so let's fast forward here. You have determined that your story could benefit from a romantic subplot and your characters definitely have chemistry and would be so cute together. How do you actually write it? So first things first, remember that this is a subplot, not the main plot. It's not the reason your readers are picking up the book or watching your movie if you're a screenwriter. If we wanted a romance to take over the story, we would be reading a romance story. Don't let the romance distract from the A plot, which is alien invasion, or an epic fantasy quest, or surviving the vampire school prom. Whatever it is, that is the focus. The subplot, that is a bonus. Once you've got that drilled into your head, you've got a couple of options on how to write this subplot. Now we have the standard romantic subplot trope, which is character A meets character B, they grow closer together over the course of the story, sharing vulnerabilities, secrets, and moments, and then either at the end of the story or right around the climax, they have the big kiss, which signals that they are now in a relationship. Now there is nothing wrong with that type of romantic subplot. This can even be one of the most enjoyable parts of the story if you take your time with it and let the relationship grow organically. Rick Riordan is really good at this. Percy and Annabeth are two main leads. They meet in book one when they're 12, but we don't even get our first serious hints of a crush until book three. They don't kiss until book four, and they don't start a relationship until book five. Similarly, Nico and Will had to go over the significant hurdle of Nico's internalized homophobia and self-hatred. So him starting a relationship with Will is part of a greater arc of self-acceptance and love. It was the period at the end of a long sentence, basically. Now the downside to writing this type of romantic subplot is that 95% of all other romantic subplots do the exact same thing in different formats. You've got the meet cute, which I just described. You've also got childhood friends to lovers. You got rivals or enemies to lovers. There's a guy with a crush on a girl who doesn't even know he exists and he ends up getting the girl at the end. So many others. I'm not saying this trope has been done to death, but it is very, very common. You might want to consider getting a little creative with how your characters meet or interact if you want your story to stand out. Or you could use those popular romantic subplot tropes to subvert and create cute 
plot twists in your story, like what happened in Children of Blood and Bone. Spoilers for the first book coming up. So the main character, Zele, is this girl who's trying to bring magic back to the land after it's been gone for a while, and the royal prince, Inan, is trying to stop her, and that makes them enemies. Now halfway through this whole chasing quest thing, because of telepathic magic that he has absolutely no control over, Inan basically gets Zele's entire life story just dropped in his head and he realizes that he and his family have been the bad guys in all this and he ends up joining her side. Literally the next day they start a romantic relationship. Now as I was reading the story my first thought was Zele, girl, he tried to kill you two days ago. What the fuck? Like this is going really fast. Are you sh <sighs> whatever this the rest of the story has been pretty great. Let's, let's just keep reading whatever so he kept reading about three four chapters later Inan betrays Zele he goes back to his dad and he totally fucks everything up I genuinely did not see this coming because Ariyami set this whole thing up to be like a love redeems the villain redemption arc so that's what I was expecting now despite the twist I initially still did not like the romantic elements because I thought there was a better way to handle it but as I was starting book two and looking back on book one, I realized I was wrong. There was no better way to handle it because that's how Inan and Zele just are. They're both super intense, impulsive people in a super high pressure situation. Their explosive coming together and falling apart is exactly in character for them. And the fallout of their relationship, short as it was, had far reaching consequences in book two, making things even harder for the both of them. So yes, you can do a regular romantic subplot. You can use the tropes that we're expecting from such a story to create mind-bending plot twists. Or you could use a more unconventional romantic subplot on an already established couple. These do pop up from time to time. You've got the couple that is married or have been dating for a long time and one of them thinks the other is cheating. Or the couple has been dating for a while and one of them wants to propose. Or they're an established couple and they break up because they realize that they're not good for each other. Or at least one of them realizes that the other one isn't good for her. Or you've got an established couple that wants or doesn't want but gets kids. What I haven't seen and I kind of want to is something like an established couple that is actually really, really casual, so like more of a friends with benefits situation, and then by the end of the story, they are in a serious, committed relationship. Or even an older couple with a teenage or adult child who is the chosen one, and they go along with them to not let their child die. These stories all take place after the big kiss, and as such are really, really rare. Like I said, 95% of all romantic subplots take place before that. They're the build-up, the starting the romantic relationship. And I think that's because that part is, I guess, more dramatic and exciting than maintaining a romantic relationship, unless there's some sort of crisis going on. Which is a damn shame, because a lot of my personal favorite romantic subplots and couples have already established couples dealing with things like the end of the world, or monster hunting, or whatever. Now I would like to delve into example of a really well written subplot that has an established couple doing all this. Unfortunately, the best known example of a story that includes a relevant romantic subplot beyond the big kiss includes the couple essentially body snatching and strictly speaking assaulting an innocent third party so you know what let's talk about the mummy now the first mummy movie not that one centered around librarian and archaeologist evie who enlists the help of american soldier o'connell to find an ancient egyptian city and they accidentally wake up a powerful evil mummy in the process now in between all the fighting and the dramatic rescues and the comedic moments the two grow closer together and they end the film by walking into the sunset with a big bag of ancient treasure very standard romantic subplot then we got a sequel which takes place about a decade after after the fact. Now let's pause right here and compare this to National Treasure, which the first movie does 
basically the same thing. But in the sequel to National Treasure, the two leads have broken up, which is very, very common. Whenever you've got a sequel that's supposed to pick up after a romance like this, either they've broken up or the relationship is having problems or one of them has died. It's basically any excuse the writer can think of to not actually write the relationship that they spent so much time putting together in the first place. And I genuinely do not get that. I mean, God, like, come on. We, we put so much effort, time, and energy into getting these two people to get together, but we don't actually get to see them stay together? Come on, come on! <sighs> now in National Treasure 2, they've broken up, and then it's awkward romantic tension until they decide to start together again, despite having tried it before and it just didn't work out. And this, by the way, is a personal pet peeve of mine. When two characters used to date and then had a messy breakup but are now forced to work together again and that's only in their backstory because drama the world is about to blow up we don't need more drama and this is something that the mummy 2 understands because when we next see evie and o'connell they've been happily married for years and have a kid this obviously changes some things but it also doesn't Evie and O'Connell are still going on dangerous, ill-advised archaeological quests to recover ancient magical artifacts. Only now they have to hire a babysitter when they're doing this at night. O'Connell is more emotionally tethered and mature. He actually treats Evie with respect and listens to her desires and opinions, which was a little lacking in the first movie. And Evie's learned to fight! which I thought was brilliant. Now this is in part because she's getting some weird reincarnation memories from a past life where she was this warrior bodyguard princess, but it's mostly because O'Connell clearly took the time to teach her some moves after having to save her life at least twice in the last movie, which is very much in character for both O'Connell and Evie wanting to learn. Whoa, whoa! When did you learn to do that? <laughs> Father. They're the same people, but they've grown and developed together. And you can see how their marriage and having a child has done that. I think, if nothing else, the most important takeaway is that each set of characters is unique, and thus every romantic relationship is unique. Authors get in trouble when they try to force something that doesn't belong. Or they do the cookie cutter, every story I know of has a romantic subplot so mine will too type of thing. Romantic subplots are supposed to be fun and engaging. A nice little added bonus, a spice to an otherwise fine story. If you're not having fun with it, then neither are your readers. But if you are having fun, even if it's just torturing these characters and their emotions rather than letting them be happy, then you're probably on the right track. Those are mine, or more honestly, my mother's tips on writing romantic subplots. Share your favorite rom subs in the comments below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and if you can, support us on Patreon. Link in the description. Bye lovelies!